I was thinking over things with Christmas being just yesterday, and isn't it interesting that when God came to earth, He first appeared as a helpless child. And then, in Matthew 18, when He wanted to show the disciples what it looks like to be a true follower of Him, He asked a little child to come and sit upon His lap, right? Isn't that interesting? that so much be bound up around the idea of a child as to entering the kingdom of heaven. Being childlike doesn't save us, though. I mean, I've heard some people say, well, I'd like to be childlike forever, right? That, that's, what, that's not what that means. That's not what's getting you in to the kingdom of heaven. The idea is a being a young child that will listen and trust. And even when a child can't physically see something, if somebody in authority tells them it's there, they begin to see it, don't they? They begin to see what it's like. We should be the same way with our Lord. Here we have that heavenly birth announcement to the disciples. And it says there, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now I want you to notice something here. It says that all of a sudden there was this big bunch of heavenly hosts. You know, it was just one angel and then all of a sudden, boom! They saw them everywhere. All over the skies, the angelic beings were all around them. And they didn't know it. But can I tell you something, church? The heavenly hosts were always there. The spiritual world is always there. We just don't always see it. We don't think about it. We don't grasp it in our minds, in our day-to-day -day lives, that there is this spiritual reality outside of the physical. We don't grasp that. There's this division between the spiritual world and the earthly world. And sometimes we recognize it. We'll, we'll have a feeling. We'll, we'll feel a presence. We'll feel a, a leading of the Holy Spirit to do this or that. That's how it was when I got saved. The Lord just kept after me. I could feel His presence pulling me to the front of the church that I might go down and bow my head and say, Lord, please save me. And that's what occurred, right? But I can't explain that from any physical means. It was a spiritual calling leading me down there to that altar to bow my head that day. And I felt things like that over and over. That spiritual reality going on around me. It's always there. We just don't always recognize it. Amen. But I've learned, I've learned that other reality is always there. And here's the thing. These two things affect one another. Your physical and your spiritual. They affect one another. The heavenly realm and the physical realm. You say, where do you get that? Well, just from what we just read. What does it say here? It says, glory to God in the highest. So glory to God is being given in the highest, right? And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. It reflects. You understand? What happens when on earth we have peace, goodwill toward men? There's glory to God in heaven. Right? What did Jesus say was the greatest commandments? He said, if you break down the Ten Commandments into a half and half, one's about God, one's about others, love God and love others. Right? That, that's what he said. The whole of the law fills up in those two commandments, right? To love God and love others. And when we love others, God is glorified. And when we love God, we'll love others, right? There is this reflection between the heavenly and the physical realm that is always going on, we just don't always see it. Sometimes we wonder why we're having all these physical issues. We want to look at everything else and don't think about the spiritual in the situation. You understand what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying here? 
that we need to look to the spiritual as well. The church works and lives in between these two realities. And this is the importance of the, of the church's mission. We have that connection with the true, right, spiritual, with God and all of that. We are called to go out into the world and rescue the people in this physical world who don't have that heavenly connection like we do. You understand? You following me here this morning? We're called to go in like into a battlefield out here in this physical world, this physical world that does not want to love others, it sure doesn't want to love God, and go show them the message of the gospel. That they might repent and come to the truth. Because that's the reality of things. This physical world's going away, all right? And all that'll stand is what was done for God in the end, okay? The real reality is the one that you can't see right now. You understand? That's the true reality. Think of that old movie, Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Forrest was out there in the woods, and he was in a battle, and they started shooting at him, and Forrest ran out, and he was very fast. Everybody remembers what it said in that movie. Run, Forrest, run, right? Because Forrest was so fast. He wasn't the brightest one on the, top, on the, the group, but he was fast, right? And so all of his friends fall down around him because all the gunfire was going on, right? Forrest, though, he makes it to safety. He makes it to peace, right? He makes it to a safe place. But he doesn't stay in a safe place, does he? What did he do? I got to go find my friend Bubba, right? <laughs> Y'all remember that? He runs back looking for Bubba. He, and then he finds somebody else other than Bubba, throws him on his shoulder, and runs and takes him back to the safe place, right? He was, he was hoping Bubba would come with him. But he wasn't able to get Bubba. That's what we do, church. We go into this world where these people don't know where the safe place is and we're going and bringing them to the safe place. You understand? And I tell you what, as we start this new year, maybe we ought to start hollering, run, church, run. Right? Maybe we need to get running out here to go bring those people into the safe place that they might know the Lord and Savior. We've been given two tools to do this mission to bring peace to the world. Two tools, the keys to heaven and the power to loose and bind on earth is what the Bible tells us. In Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 is where it discusses this. But Jesus had taken his disciples and um, he asked them, who do you think I am? That's a good question to start with when you want to go offer somebody the keys to the kingdom. Who do you think Jesus is? There's a lot of people out here, they think he's just a man. Oh, he's a good teacher. He's, if you think he's just a good teacher, you're crazy, all right? The man claimed to be God. Either, he's, either he is God or he's crazy. It's one or the other, right? It's what C.S. Lewis's famous uh, uh, analogy was. Either he's somebody who's uh, on the mindset of a poached egg or he is the God of gods and the Lord of lords or he's just a flat-out liar. Which one is it? It's one of those three, isn't it? So the re reality is here, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you think he was? And people had all sorts of answers like they do today. All sorts of different popular opinions about who Jesus is. Finally, Peter looked up and he kind of responded for the rest of the twelve. And he said that thou art the Christ. We discussed what that was last Sunday, right? The Christ, the Son of the living God. And that confession took Peter from one reality to the other. All right? That confession made him new. Now, it was right before Christ would return and the Holy Spirit would come and there's lots of different things going on in there. But let me tell you, folks, when you declare from your heart under the pull of that Holy Spirit that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you've changed realities, all right? You're in a different world than you used to be. But he said that. And after that great confession... After that great confession, in Matthew 16, 19, he starts talking about what that means after you've made that confession, about the tools that you have that's been given to you by God and the church. And he said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what are these keys to the kingdom? What is this loosing and binding he's talking about? Well, many people's got this very confused down through the centuries. Some people took this, this he's given this solely to Peter, 
And Peter is supposed to have been the first pope, which is ridiculous because he couldn't have qualified because he was married, according to Catholic law. And they say that the pope up here, he's got the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and you can't go to heaven unless you follow him. I'm not supposed to follow him. I'm supposed to follow Jesus, right? Amen. He didn't confess the pope as the, uh, as the one, did he? As the son of the living God. He confessed Jesus as the son of of the living God. Well, some people get it confused and they say, well, that's where these different priests down through the centuries, they're supposed to lay hands on this priest and that priest and that priest. And that is the only true church, they'll say. They're the only ones that have the true keys to the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's not what I'm reading here. I didn't read anything like that in the text I read here today. What I heard was when a believer confesses Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, he's been given the keys to the kingdom, right? Amen. The keys are in his pocket, right? He carries them around with him. And he can offer those keys to other people that they might get in as well, right? That's what it all comes down to. It's the doors to the kingdom of heaven. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Isn't it all pretty simple when you sit down and you actually take a look at what it says? Jesus is laying out the foundation for his church. This is one of the first places you see the word church. The word in Greek is ekklesia. It means the called out ones. I got the key. You won't come get it? They called them out, didn't they? That's the idea. And so the key has been given, but only those who have entered into the doors get a key to offer to somebody else. And Peter, he offered the key to other people, didn't he? After the Holy Spirit was given, Acts chapter 2, he got up and he preached the gospel, didn't he? And it says the people were convicted of the heart when they heard it. The Holy Spirit, that spiritual reality, was tugging at their hearts that day. And 3,000 people come forward when Peter said, well, repent and follow Jesus Christ, right? They come forward and they got saved, didn't they? And they got baptized and they joined the church, right? That very day of the Jewish people. Then in Acts 8, he, he comes and he offers the keys to the Samaritan people, right? And the Samaritans, they come and they receive the keys, you know? These believers have these keys. And then in Acts chapter 10, you see the Gentiles, right? They come in, right? They, he offers the keys to them and they come in. But Peter's not the only one offering keys throughout the Bible, is he? Right? We, we see old Philip. He goes down he meets the Ethiopian eunuch, doesn't he? And what does Philip do? Does he say, well, I've got to go get Peter so you can get saved? No. He says, here's the key. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then you can get baptized. Acts 8, 37, right? You have the keys. Here's the sad point. We walk around. Got the most precious keys in history in our hands. You understand? Can you think of anything more important than eternal life? Anything? Money, riches, gold? Anything more important then eternal life, beginning from the moment you take the key and you turn it within the lock. Nothing more important. And what do we do? That person might look funny if I bring that key out in this conversation. I better put it back in my pocket. That person might get, we might be, get kind of nervous if we begin to talk about those keys in my pocket, right? I mean, they might get a little anxious and you know, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want to hurt the situation, right? By pulling my keys out of my pocket and offering them to them, right? Is that not what we do? But we have the greatest keys ever given within our hands. Don't keep them in your pockets this year, church. Pull them out. Offer them. Offer them to people. What's this idea here of loosing and binding? Well, the keys open the door of the kingdom, but when you go through the door, you choose to live in a different kingdom, don't you? Than this physical world out here. A different place. Different rules of society apply within this kingdom than apply out there. All right? It's a different world than where you come from. And it might be best understood in Matthew 18, uh, verses 15 through 17, we're given the instructions for what they call church discipline. Say, church discipline? I've never heard that. Yep, there's such a thing as church discipline. 
And, and it's in the spirit of Matthew 18. But a lot of people, they look at church discipline. I mean, they've got different ideas. It's like, we're coming in and, and we're going to be like the, the people on top of you. And we're going to force you out. And we're going to do all this. That's not at all what church discipline is about. Matter of fact, it goes back to all those people who have those keys, right? All the people that have the keys in their hand, they can enact church discipline. How do they do that? How does that work? Jesus said this. He said, if somebody you see in sin, or they trespass against you, the idea, go tell them privately, if you think they've got the keys to the kingdom of heaven too, you tell them privately about this, and you work it out. If you see them in sin. Do you care enough about somebody, your brothers and sisters here, that if you see them in sin, you go talk to them about it, and you work it out privately, and make sure everything's okay? Well, if they don't listen to you, they don't repent from that, and, and you see this going on, well, that tells you to go take a couple of others from the church and go talk with them about it. You know, you're in this deep sin. We're concerned about you. We're concerned about you. You are in a bad condition. You are not acting like somebody... I like pulling these keys out there. That has the keys, right? You're acting like somebody that don't have the keys. There's something wrong here. Well, if they won't listen to you, you go back and you tell the whole church. Man, we don't, let's send the whole church in to go check on them, okay? There's something wrong here. These, they, they think they have the keys to the kingdom of heaven, but it sure don't look like they got the keys, okay? Because they're living completely outside of the kingdom of heaven, right? They're living just like the world is, right? So let's all go down there. And finally, when they won't repent from that, well, we just determine them not to be saved, and they're back on the list of people we've got to go offer the keys to. You understand? Everything's pretty simple in the Bible if you, say, if you don't get too tore up in it, all right? It's pretty simple. What, what, what are you saying, Scott? Are you saying the church? How can the church determine that? How does the church know those things, whether or not that they are in sin or they are lost? How would they even be able to make a judgment like that? Well, Matthew 18, 18 through 20 says this, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye, ye that's us, the church, ye, all of us, shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Remember, there's this reflection. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on the earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. In Jesus, you know, we use that often, that verse to say, well, there ain't many people here tonight, so let's get through it anyway. <laughs> right? Boy, it says so much more than that. In Jesus' day, to bind and loose was understood by the rabbis as declaring this is a forbidden activity and this is a permitted activity. And Jesus is telling us here that the church, the true church, knows what's right and what's wrong. And they can make a decision on whether or not a person is lost or saved because the church is connected to heaven. We have that Holy Spirit connection, right? Amen. Now, that's an unpopular opinion, isn't it? You mean you're saying that some people ain't going to heaven? Yes, I am. You mean you're saying that some people that said they're going to heaven ain't going to heaven? Yes, I am. Why do you say that? Because of the Holy Spirit within me and what the Word of God says right in front of me, okay? I can tell what's going on. Now, I don't know every ins and outs of your entire life. I don't know everything about you. But I know what the Word of God says. We can look at things in society and make judgment based on God's Spirit in us and His Word written down. The world will tell you that it's absolutely fine uh, to go out and have your baby murdered before it's born. Right? Is that not what the world tells us? Is that not the rule of the society in which we live in? Perfectly fine, they'll tell us, right? There'll be no legal action for that. Right? Right? But what does the church, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God tell us? That's sin. That's wrong. We cannot do that. The world will tell us that you should have sexual freedom. No one should tell you what happens within your bedroom. There should be no kind of uh, 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 rule of society about that whatsoever. That's what the world will tell you. But remember, the world don't know, right? But what will the Holy Spirit tell you? And the Word of God tell you? It'll tell you that's sin, right? Amen. It'll tell you that's not somebody who lives in the kingdom of heaven. That's not somebody who's going to heaven that's living in that sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 will flat out tell you all these things, right? 
the world out here. It'll tell you that greed is good. It doesn't matter who gets in your way. You push them out of the way, okay? You get what you need because uh, th- that's the way our society is made, right? You can stomp on the little guy. You can come through and you can wipe out a business that employs hundreds and hundreds of people all for the sake of you having a tax write-off, Right? You can do that. And the world will say that's perfectly fine. There's not a thing wrong with it. You destroyed all these people's lives and you ruined their lives. But what does God say? Love thy neighbor as as you love thyself, right? What does God say? He says, put yourself aside for others. (laughs) Are you in the kingdom? Are you in the kingdom today? And what authority do we do this on? We do this on the authority that where two or three are gathered together in His name. The church has the Holy Spirit. I know that when I went forward as a young boy and I got saved, after that I didn't know what all the rules of the new kingdom was. But I know I went out and broke a few of them. You know what? And when I'd break them, I'd have this issue. I hadn't read all the Bible then. I didn't know everything it said. I'd heard what people had told me, but I'd have this gnawing thing inside of me. That ain't right. You shouldn't be doing that. That isn't what you should be doing. Why did I have that in me? Because the Holy Spirit was in me telling me that it was wrong, right? And so that that Holy Spirit tells us, but not only that, we have the Scriptures in front of us. 1 Timothy 3.15 says that the church is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And and again, people try to take that and say, well, that means this this church over here is the one that's that's, uh, in authority. This church over here, what is it saying? The true church is the one that holds up the truth, right? (laughs) The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. We hold up the truth, right? You want to know if you're in a real church? This is what they're preaching, okay? They're holding up the truth of the Word of God. Even when it's unpopular and people don't want to accept it because they love people. You understand? They're holding it up for that reason. We have the Bible, God's written word preserved down to us. And we as a church today, we're about to receive the Lord's Supper here. We're doing it a little differently than we've done it over past years. But we do this as a remembrance until He returns. And only the church here today should partake of this. Children aren't ready. They aren't ready. I believe that the Lord has them, but they're not ready, okay? Until after they're saved. Lost people, if you're lost and you're here today and you take up this cup, you're pretty much toasting your own damnation because we're remembering until He comes when He's going to come and He's going to judge the world in righteousness. So you don't want to take it for that reason. And as a believer in 1 Corinthians 11, it tells us that people have died taking this because they did it in an unworthy manner. An unworthy manner. And that's another time where you see the physical world and the spiritual world connect, right? This is a holy thing, my friend, what we're about to do. This is a holy rite that we're about to go through. And the question I have for you today is how well connected are you? The other day, I got a phone call in my office. You know, I do IT work. And they told me that the computer they had had the blue screen of death. Some of y'all know what that is. And you cringe, right? The blue screen of death. And what that basically means is that the computer will not come up. All you get is this ugly blue screen that tells you to go find your IT administrator, okay? Well, I went up there and I came to look at it and I began to fool with it and I turned it off and turned it on. That's the thing you got to do if you're an IT person. You turn it off and you turn it on, right? But I, I did that and then I unplugged it. I took it from the power and it still wouldn't come up. So I had to go a little bit deeper. I had to take the, the cover off of the computer. I had to pick up the memory. I had to pull the memory out and I had to reconnect it in. And then I reconnected a number of memory stick. And then I took the hard drive and I disconnected it and I made sure everything was good and secure. Everything was well connected within that machine. And then I put it up. And, and another thing all IT professionals ought to do is learn how to pray, right? That this computer will come back up. And I, I pushed the button upon the computer. And it was kind of dark for a minute. And I was looking for blue and I prayed, I don't see a blue screen here, you know. 
And I kind of said, well, I'll just walk away and I'll let it be and we'll see what happens. And I got a phone call a little while later. They said, well, it come back up. It come back up. What was the problem? It wasn't connected. Or it wasn't well connected enough to get started. Some of us in our Christian walk were not very well connected and that's why the Lord tells us to examine ourselves before we receive the Lord's Supper every time we receive it. Are you forgiving those ones around you for what they've done to you? You know what they did. You know what occurred in your life. Are you living a life of forgiveness? Or are you holding on to a life of hate? Are you holding on to love within your life? Because that's the greatest thing about God is loving one another, right? Are you loving one another for real and living in that way? Are you dealing with personal sin within your life? Because I told you, we're not perfect yet, are we? We're on our way to where it is perfect, but we're not there yet. Are you dealing with known sin within your life? Because my friend, you want to deal with it before you receive the Lord's Supper, okay? Because you're not making a good connection into the spiritual world until you deal with stuff like that. The Bible says that if you're not forgiving, you're not forgiven. Because you don't understand what forgiveness is. You understand? If you're not loving, you don't know the one who is love, okay? If you're out in sin, you're with the Satan rather than with the Savior, all right? You need to examine yourselves this morning. That's what this is all about as we go into this Lord's Supper. In Matthew 18, I was talking about it earlier, Jesus has a little child come and sit upon his lap. I've saw many kids over the years go up to Santa's lap, right? And sometimes a kid just throws an absolute fit. Ah! You know? They don't want to have anything to do with going to Santa's lap. But that child who truly trusts their mom and dad and trusts that uh, they're putting them in a safe place, they'll sit there, right? They'll sit there. Jesus is right here this morning. You understand me? Amen, he's right here. He's at this altar. And he's waiting for you to come do business with him this morning. You understand me? He's right here. Say, I don't see him, Scott. Oh, he's here. He's here. And He'll meet you right here at this altar this morning if you'll come. He'll direct you within this congregation to somebody you love in here. Somebody that you're having issues with. He'll have you hug their neck and tell them that you love them. He'll do that. He'll take your hand. He'll walk you over there. I never will forget when my, I, got up, I was going to go to the altar. I was scared to go. And my dad offered, he said, I'll walk with you all the way if you'll go on up to the altar. Well, he didn't have to because it was like a slippery slope when I went down. I just, boom, there I went. But he said he'd walk with me. Somebody else took my hand that day. You understand? Somebody whom I could not see walked me all the way down to that altar that day and I received grace. It was my Lord and Savior, someone I could not see. He'll do that for you here this morning. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.